Good morning. morning. Welcome to the House of the Lord, to St. Philip Lutheran Church here in Raleigh, North Carolina for our service of worship and praise this Sunday morning. This is the third Sunday of Epiphany, that season of the church year in which we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ was revealed to be Lord and Savior of all creation, indeed of all humanity. We are delighted that you have chosen to worship here with us this morning, either in person or online. Uh, It is a blessing to have you here. We are blessed by your presence and your participation in this worship service. Uh, If you are a visitor, we ask that you please fill out a blue and teal card in the pew racks there in front of you so that we may have a record of your visitation with us. You may place it in the offering plates in the back, either during offering time uh, or as you depart the sanctuary at the conclusion of worship. Uh, Last but not least, we thank you as always for your continued financial support of our mission and ministry here at St. Philip. Uh, Put quite simply, we could not do it without you. We never take that for granted, uh, and we appreciate you more than you know. At this time, we ask that you please rise as you are able for our brief order of confession and forgiveness of sin found printed on page 2 of your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin now in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant. Renew your creation. Restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. By the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is Guide Me Ever, Great Redeemer.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's holy word. first reading this morning is from the third chapter of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We will read responsively from Psalm 62. For God alone I wait in silence. Truly, my hope is in God. God alone. In God is my deliverance and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in God always, O people. Pour out your hearts before the one who is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath. Those of low estate cannot be trusted. Placed on the scales together, they weigh even less than a breath. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it, that power belongs to God. Steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay all according to their deeds. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. 
As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for who you are and all that you do for us. We praise you for being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for blessing us with this new day which we have never seen before, a beautiful winter day in your creation. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you once again in spirit and in truth to share our lives with one another and to lean on each other in our times of need. We ask now that you would speak a word to us of healing and joy and transformation. We are eager to be in your presence, in your house, among your people on your day. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sermon text for this morning is the gospel lesson assigned for us this day, this third Sunday of Epiphany, namely Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Uh, my sermon title for this morning is based on the first six words of verse number 15, and saying the time is fulfilled, the time is fulfilled. Uh, my sermon title for this morning is an entirely different way of reckoning time. An entirely different way of reckoning time. This brief section of text we have before us this morning from the earliest written of the four Gospels marks the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He has only done two things before this text, both in fairly short order. He has been baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist and he has been tempted or tested in the desert by Satan. I've always found this order of events intriguing and instructive. Jesus is baptized, then he is tempted or tested, and then he begins his ministry. In other words, he is claimed by God, then battles Satan, and then begins blessing other people. I think for many of us, we unintentionally and without reflection reverse the order and think that we have to battle Satan, whatever form that may take for us, first. Then, if we emerge somewhat victorious, we can be claimed or blessed or approved by God, and then we can begin to really be of service to other people. It's that erroneous way of thinking that we got to get right with God first before God blesses us and uses us in this world. Uh, that will never happen, though because you can never get right with God on your own. And so you will keep putting off your own usage by God and to the world because you will always be overly focused on your own sinfulness and unworthiness. So even in verses 9 through 15 here in the first chapter of Mark's gospel, Jesus' life events serve in part as a template for our own. You are claimed and blessed and approved by God first. As God's child and servant, a free gift received by faith in the waters of baptism before you undergo any spiritual tribulation or demonic oppression. And because you undergo such struggles and sufferings already claimed by God, God will see you through them, dusting you off every time you fall and fail, using you the whole time to be a blessing to and of service to others. That, I believe, is the correct paradigm and understanding Jesus sets up for us in these opening verses. So don't waste your time waiting for the right moment 
of being acceptable to God for the right moment already occurred 2,000 years ago. The next thing to notice in the very first recorded words out of Jesus' mouth in this earliest of Gospels, uh, if you have a red letter version, this is the first appearance of red ink. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This, my friends, is the summary statement of Jesus' entire message. Every sermon, whether on a mount or on a plain, every discourse, whether on discipleship or on the end of time, every parable, whether uh, on sowers and seeds, wheat and tares, leaven, pearls, dragnets, or fig trees, harkens back to, depends on, and elaborates upon the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Many scholars posit that the whole of Mark is but an expansion on this one verse. That means every exorcism, every healing, every miracle, every feeding, every calming of every storm, every restoration, every walking on water, every spitting, making mud and spreading it on eyes or sticking of fingers in ears, every turning of water into wine, wine into blood and blood into covenant hinges on, demonstrates and amplifies the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. In the Greek language in which this New Testament was originally written, there are two words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos refers to chronological or sequential time. That is time which can be measured in seconds, minutes, hours, weeks, months, years, and so on. Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, refers to, and I'm quoting now, A moment of indeterminate time in which everything happens. An opportune moment, due season, ripeness, the appointed time in the purpose of God. The time when God acts, when eternity intersects a moment in this world. We, of course, as human beings, live in both ways of thinking about time. But our secular way of being has us really only attentive to chronos time, to five-day work weeks or school weeks and two-day weekends and vacations when we're able to take it. But Scripture is constantly reminding us of and calling attention to sacred kairos time in our lives. Ecclesiastes famously reminds us, For everything there is a season, And a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. Our second lesson today from 1 Corinthians informs us the appointed time has grown short. And the present form of this world is passing away. Mordecai compels Queen Esther by asking, Who knows whether you have not come to the throne for such a time as this? James condemns our human greed by saying, What is your life? For you are but a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Romans exclaims, Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. Behold, the day is at hand. 2 Corinthians is downright arresting. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Second Peter declares, with the Lord one day is as what? A thousand years, and a thousand years are as one day. The Psalms admonish us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. All these and more call our attention to the fact that though we live in a world measured by secular chronos time, more importantly, we inhabit a space saturated with sacred, rich, pregnant, momentous kairos time. You may recall the old cliche, carpe diem, seize the day. The kingdom of God in this text 
is not some far away, by and by, pie in the sky, reality confined to the afterlife, but rather a reality that has come near in the person of Jesus of Nazareth and is still near, as near as the Holy Spirit dwelling inside you and inside the person seated on either side of you right now. Repent is the next thing that Jesus says. The concept of repentance has fallen out of vogue over the years, particularly for us more dignified mainline Protestants. We have largely abandoned it to the province of crazy hysterical street corner preachers with bullhorns or denominations that we think try to scare people to God rather than love them to God. And yet repentance is squarely at the center of Jesus' message. Repentance means more than confession more than apologizing. It actually means a turning, a 180 degree turn from one direction to another. Insofar as we think about repenting, we tend to think of turning away from certain unhealthy, dysfunctional, sinful behaviors and actions. But an intriguing possible reading of the text suggests something different. Instead of Jesus saying, repent, and then following that up with, and stop lying, cheating, stealing, cursing, having sex outside of marriage, etc., 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 he says, repent and believe in the good news. One possible way to read this text is that what we need to repent of is not believing in the good news. What if? What you and I most need to repent of is our lack of belief in this good news kingdom. Of not believing that our sins are really, truly, actually forgiven. Of not believing that we are now in good and right standing with God. Of not believing that we are worthy and beloved in God's eyes. Of not accepting The fact that God has declared us to be holy and righteous and of use in His kingdom. So many of us walk around all too aware of our inadequacies and failings. Too trapped in and paralyzed by guilt and shame. To ever really embrace the fact that the kingdom of God that Jesus came to embody and proclaim is fundamentally good news, not bad And if we could ever repent of that, of disbelieving, turn 180 degrees to the opposite, we would experience true freedom and true joy, perhaps for the first time ever. The remainder of today's text concerns Jesus' calling His first disciples. As you can see there, they are two sets of brothers. Simon, Peter, and Andrew, James, and John. Peter, James, and John in particular will feature prominently in the upcoming years of Jesus' ministry. They are all fishermen, and they all ply their trade on the Sea of Galilee, in whose vicinity will be Jesus' new home base for His ministry, as well as the general site for most of His miracles. When Jesus encounters them, they are performing two activities, two duties. You can see there in your text. The first pair is casting their nets into the sea, while the second pair is mending their nets. A generous reading of this is that this reflects a measure of success. They cast out their nets, bring in large quantities of fish, which then eventually and periodically necessitates mending those nets. In such a reading, when they respond to the call of Christ, they are leaving behind success. That, of course, would be very challenging to do and would in part demonstrate their courage and clarity. Are you called to leave behind success? Another way to read it is more metaphorical. How often do we cast out our lives, hearts, love, money, etc., only to be injured in the process and have to mend those very things 
later on. I bet you anything that you've cast out a dream before, come up empty and had to mend, or cast out your heart in love to someone else, been neglected or betrayed and had to mend. In this manner of thinking, casting and mending is a repetitive, draining and exhausting thing to have to do over the years. It is an unending cycle of disappointment. Understood this way, these two sets of brothers may have been chomping at the bit for something better, eager to leave behind the despair and embrace a new call. Regardless, the word immediately occurs twice in this text, once describing Jesus' call in verse 20 and once describing their response in verse 18. So things are happening very quickly here. And not only do they leave behind their business, their trade, but in the case of James and John anyway, their families. Their father Zebedee is left behind in the boat. We don't like to talk about this much, but the call to follow Christ can very possibly entail leaving home, family, and loved ones behind, either geographically or in terms of their expectations of you. And of course, the form of Jesus' invitation or call can be quoted from memory by many of us. Follow me and I will make you, the old translation says, fishers of men. Follow me, I will make you fish for people. This call, this invitation by Jesus is really quite staggering when you think of it. Before he begins his ministry of preaching and teaching, of healing and miracles, he calls his first disciples. Apparently, he wants them to observe, to hear, and to partake of everything. And then to join in and participate in this very inbreaking of God's kingdom. Rather than this being some sort of enterprise that they simply passively watch, they are invited to participate in the teaching, participate in the deliverance, participate in the healings and the restorations. And ultimately, it is a call to evangelism, a call to spread the gospel or the good news, a call to fish for people. Again, if you have a red letter edition of scripture which highlights the words Jesus himself spoke, you will see his first words are in order. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent, believe in the good news, follow me, And I will make you fish for people. The first thing we are to do in such a schema is repent. Turn 180 degrees. The second thing is to believe. And specifically believe in this good news of forgiveness, reconciliation, freedom, and joy. The third thing we are to do is to follow Jesus. And the fourth thing is to allow him to make us fishers of people and all of this happens all of this occurs under the banner of a kairos moment the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near allow the seconds minutes and hours of your watch to be lost and dissolved in a different kind of time a rich pregnant momentous occasion where the other kind of time, Kronos, stops. Where it's God's time instead. Where anything is possible. Where anything can occur. An appointed time in the mind of God. A due season. A prolonged instance of eternity intersecting with that very moment when God's right hand rests upon your shoulder and anoints you for the task at hand. May you see, feel, and experience this worship service right now as a kairos moment. May you see, feel, and experience the remainder of this day and evening as a kairos moment. May you be in tune and in touch with that aspect of eternity present in every encounter you have for the remainder of this week. 
May the membrane between heaven and earth, between holy and mundane, be so thin and permeable this week that in every person you encounter, you see the image and the likeness of God. That in every interaction and conversation you have, you hear the potential voice of God being spoken and received. That in every moment, you have a heightened awareness of a God who is ever-present and whose very presence means that anything, anything, anything at all is possible. Every breath you take is a gift. Every time your heart beats, you know you are alive. Every thought your brain has is a testament to the mind of the Creator who designed it. Every gesture of kindness has eternal significance. Every act of compassion vibrates through the universe. Every smile and kind word contributes to the betterment of somebody else's day. Every acknowledgement of the presence of another human being has cosmological consequence. Every contribution of time, gifts, and money has unseen ramifications. Every act of selflessness gathers into a divine pool of grace and mercy. Every instance of humility bespeaks a godly mindset. Every occasion of gratitude reflects the wisdom which created this world. Every act of justice makes the angels sing and the stars of heaven dance. Every act of courage, particularly in the face of demonic opposition, transcends the bonds of Kronos and expands and explodes and ripples the sublime realm of Kairos. As the Jewish sages of yore once remarked, whoever saves one person saves an entire universe. That, in large measure, is how you fish for people. Allow the moment to be a Kairos moment. Allow each and every moment to be a Kairos moment. It's an entirely different way of reckoning time. Amen. Please rise as you're able and join together in singing our hymn of the day, I Love to Tell the Story.
living together in trust and hope, we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessings on the church, the world, and all of creation. God, our rock and deliverance, do not let your church be shaken. We trust you, never abandon your promises to the most vulnerable among us. Give your church wisdom and empathy in its varied ministries. God of grace, receive our prayer. God of hope and <coughs> refuge, you place the fish in the sea. Guide our care of the oceans and all creatures that live in them. Hold us accountable for actions that endanger water sources and the people who depend on them. God of grace, receive our prayer. God who proclaims judgment and offers mercy, be a model to the leaders of our nation and the world. As they lead, may they follow in your way of justice and truth. God of grace, receive our prayer. God who cares for the suffering, care for survivors of assault, sexual abuse, and sustain all who minister to them. Keep safe any who live under threat of violence, those living in poverty, and any among us who are ill or in pain. God of grace, receive our prayer. God of resurrection and new life, as the first disciples shared the good news, empower us and this faith community to be open to your call. When we are uncertain of your call, assure us. When we have strayed from your ways, redirect us. God of grace. <laughs> God who holds the saints against your tender bosom, we trust you welcome them into your care. Comfort those who grieve, even as we place our hope in your salvation. God of grace. Receive our prayer. We continue to pray for justice and peace the world over especially in Ukraine, Israel, and Palestine. God of grace, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. We lift to you now, O Lord, those for whom we have special concern, either silently upon our hearts or aloud upon our lips, and we pray for healing, wisdom, and peace. God of grace, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. <clears throat> Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another now, as well as with those online via the back cameras and more personally up at the front monitor. God's peace be with you.
Jesus instructs us in his most famous sermon of all, the Sermon on the Mount, not to lay up for ourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. Rather, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven because there neither moth nor rust consume, thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you have not already given online, we invite you to join with me now in making presentation of all of our tithes and offerings unto the Lord via the offering plates in the back. We thank you very much. rise for our offertory as the grains of wheat. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Holy One, for all good things come from you. In bread and cup you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table that we receive what we seek and follow your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We celebrate together now the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Holy Communion. And now may the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church here on earth and all the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Scripture tells us that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we now pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At Jesus' table, heaven and earth are joined together as one. Come and see. You may be seated for the distribution. All are invited to the Lord's table. All are welcome at the Lord's table. Small children are invited forward for a blessing. We have a gluten-free option available uh, for you. If that is your preference, please let me know as I approach you, and that will be accommodated. We ask only that you follow the directions found printed in your bulletin and of the ushers.
rise to receive our post-communal blessing. And now may the eating of Christ's body and the drinking of his blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Redeemer, you have fed us at this table with gifts of grace, truth, and life. As you have gathered us in joy, send us now forth as messengers of your peace. Make us shine with the good news of your glory, born to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may remain standing for a couple of announcements and mission opportunities. Uh, Wednesday is Pastor's Bible Study, 10.30 a.m. and 6.45 p.m. in the music room down the hall. Uh, this year, of course, we are studying the basics of the Christian faith. This week we'll be studying baptism. All are invited out. All are welcome to attend. Uh, next Sunday is our annual congregational meeting at 10 a.m. between services. Please remember that. Please plan to attend. We need a quorum. Uh, next Sunday, 10 a.m. between services, our annual congregational meeting. Uh, my last uh, announcement concerns Marilyn Capel. Uh, she is uh, at home and of declining health. Uh, uh, she would uh, appreciate visitors. So if you would like to visit Marilyn, she would appreciate that very much, and we all would appreciate that very much. We ask only that you would call before you go over uh, so you can see how her day is going and if she feels up for a visit. Uh, further details, such as her phone number and address, I will give you outside in the hallway. Thank you for your consideration. And now receive the benediction of our Lord. Now may God bless you and keep you. Jesus grants you grace and truth and the Spirit send peace upon your hearts now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn is Go My Children with My Blessing. Partners in ministry, what is our mission? Jesus asks that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Answering that call, may you go in peace and share the love of Christ. Thanks be to God.